right, John chapter number number five, number four. I'm sorry, John four. Uh, we, we were looking at verse number 24 last time, and I want to just kind of spend a little more time on that verse tonight with you just by way of uh, trying to, to, to deal not so much with what Christ is saying to the Samaritan woman here, but just the ramifications of, of what he's saying. When he says, verse 23, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and this is explanation of why they're going to have to worship him in spirit and truth. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I talked to you last time about God being a spirit. Uh, the, the, the essence uh, of who God is in himself is, is he is a spirit. That is, he, he's invisible to, to the eye of man. You know, we talked last time about the three ways you know something the eye, the ear, and the heart. And to the first two of those, the eye and the, and, and the ear, God is invisible. You're not going to see him. Uh, the only way you're going to know him is if he reveals himself, the self-revelation of God. In Colossians 1, uh, verse 17, it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ when he created uh, all things. It, it, it says, uh, Colossians 1, 17, he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And that, that, that's, the, that's the import of in the beginning, God. When the beginning began, when, when the universe began, when the creation began, God was already there. He was before all things. That's the idea if he's outside of creation. He's independent. He has an independent self-existence. Now, as God, being, being God and being outside of, of, of time, he, his existence and his essence is in a spirit is is in the realm of a spiritual identity that's outside of our physical abilities, our rational abilities to know him. And his essence is expressed. I you know I wrote that thing on the board for you last time. That little essence box I call it. Some people draw a square, some a triangle. I I, I draw that triangle because of the three sidedness of it: the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I, I was instructed by my five-year-old grandson today, I, I was looking for something. I said, it's a little box. He says, that's not a box, Grandpa. That's a rectangle. Well, okay, now, you know, it, you understand a square and a rectangle look a lot alike. I know that technically they're not. But that's a, that's a, maybe that's a good reason to draw a triangle uh, in which you put those, those, those essences, the sovereignty of God, the righteousness of God, the justice, uh, God is love, eternal life, the veracity, the the immutability, the, the O's, the omniscience, the omnipotence, om, omnipresence of God, all those things that make up his essence. And then the, the essence of his, he, he's a spirit. Now, the issue here in John 4 what, that Christ is enjoining upon this gal and upon everybody is that in the new covenant, there, in fact, it's true in the Old Covenant, too. In the Mosaic Covenant and the Messianic Covenant, those two covenants are dealing with the issue of spiritual qualifications. What the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, did is it demonstrated that man, represented by the nation Israel, but it didn't just condemn Israel, it condemned everybody, that every mouth might be stopped, Romans says. The issue in that covenant was... was are you spiritually qualified to be used by God in his stated purpose for you? God had a purpose and a plan. He made some covenants. He made some promises that he was going to uh, use the nation of Israel, give to the nation of Israel, and use the nation of Israel to accomplish. But because God is a spirit, in order to be qualified to work with him, you have to connect with him on that level. So you're going to have to have a spiritual qualification. And the problem with man descended from Adam is that we've been separated from God because of our sin. We are spiritually unqualified. And so what the new covenant does is it brings the spiritual qualification, the, the spiritual uh, status where, whereby we are qualified and acceptable to, to, to work with God who is a spirit. If you, if you grasp the idea of God as a spirit, then you know that's where you've got, when you work with him, that's where it has to all start. 
And so the new covenant has the issue of, of working with God on the basis uh, of his uh, uh, spiritual identity. Now, you know, we, when we were talking the other day about, about God's essence, um, there, there, there's wonderful things you can study about that that, that are fascinating. Uh, in the essence of God, all of his attributes that are there, they all work together in harmony. I talked to you a little bit last time about the sovereignty of God, his free will uh, to do things, do things that are compatible with who he is. But the integrity of God is, is the, the, it, there are two essences that function together to make integrity. Uh, integrity is his holiness. God, when it says God is holy, I am holy. Be holy as I am holy, he tells Israel. The holiness of God is the integrity of God. And those things are, are made up, uh, is made up of, of his righteousness, which is the, the standard of his integrity, and his justice, which is the, the function of his integrity. Righteousness, the, the perfect uh, rightness of God, his capacity as complete and total perfection in character. His justice is always right, perfect rightness. His justice is the function of that rightness. And, and, and what his righteousness does is we've all sinned and done what? Come short of the glory of God. So his righteousness is the standard that we've come short of, but his justice is the function of his essence that judges people or blesses people, takes action based upon if you're if you don't match his righteousness, then there's judgment. If you do, there's blessing. And by the way, our point of contact with God is all, it, 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 when, the, when you think of his essence, is our point of contact with God is not his love. It's his justice. And you have to, people think, well, we're going to get to God, and God is love, and therefore he's going to be, but we think of God. God's love like our love, and it didn't like our love. God's love is the, is the motivator of his other essences. And it's the love of God that motivated the justice of God to develop a plan. It, it, it motivated all of the essences of God. And when you think of salvation, justification, and our redemption in Christ Jesus, and you begin to watch the, the different essences of God work together. His love motivates God. It motivated his omniscience, God's all-knowingness. God, the omniscience is, is his wisdom. He has perfect wisdom. So God's love motivates his wisdom to devise a wise plan of redemption and reconciliation and restoration. His justice is, the, is going to be motivated to develop a plan whereby lost sinful man can be restored. The plan is called grace. And grace is the, fun, is the plan that justice, that omniscience and justice and all these things work together. Because justice, you know, the verse in Romans 3, 25 and 26, whom God has set forth to be propitiation through faith in his blood, God's justice had faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, in the fact that God could take our sin and impute it onto his son, and that that would be a right thing to do. Would that would satisfy the righteousness, the standard of God. And that he then could take Christ's righteousness and impute it to us, so God set forth his son to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And the verse goes on to say that he might be just and the justifier. You see, where we come in contact with God is not that our sin is put under the, under the rug and just ignored and he just loves us in spite of ourself. What his justice did was demanded that his righteousness be honored and Jesus Christ comes. I mean, who would have ever thought to have asked God to do that for you? You know, that's that verse in Ephesians, but uh, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you would ask or even think. I mean, forget about asking him, would you have ever thought to have, you wouldn't have ever thought about suggesting that to God. But his omniscience thought about it. 
His love motivated it. His justice, his omniscience developed the plan. His justice executes it. Righteousness is the standard. But it's always his justice that we, we, that's where we contact him with. And when you study those things, you, to me it gets exciting. I, I get, I get, you get, into, you get it, it's sort of like getting to know your wife. <laughs> Whoa. You know, I've been married 40 years, and I, I, more and more I think I know less and less about her. But that's not because it's a bad thing. It's because you get past all that surface stuff, and you get down to the real nitty-gritty, and you get to know one another, and, and so forth. Well, getting to know the Lord and getting to know him in all of these kind of, kind of ways. And we, we, you know, we enjoy when we talk about right division. And part of the wonderful thing about dispensational Bible study is that you begin to see the, the wisdom of God. It's not just power. Everybody's talking about the power of God. Listen to this whack on the radio. Uh, and th this evening, I wanted, my wife wanted uh, something uh, for supper. So I went over to the place over here to get something. And I got the radio on. And this guy is on the radio, and he's just, you know, he's got a faith healing, word of faith, healing ministry, and all this stuff. Hey, uh, oh, this guy name out there. Dick Al, and he's, uh, you know, he's got this big thing. The, uh, Ron Knight's mother, you know, she told me after she came to understand the right division, she said, boy, if I'd have met you six months early, I'd have had a little money. I said, what's the matter? She said, he got it all. <laughs> Time to build a new building, you know, and they, every Sunday they're having to raise $100,000 and pumping them. Well, some guy called in and, and, and asked him, he said, what is this thing you teach about you, that, that if you live in godly, you shouldn't suffer? that you shouldn't be sick and shouldn't be this and that. And he really nailed the guy. I mean, he, he nailed him. And it was really funny. I listened all the way over to the hamburger place and all the way back. You no, know, I, went, I went to Starbucks and back. Listen to this guy backpedal. And I thought, nah, you, know, you, you, you get him with reality, and it doesn't work. Well, we do that kind of thing. You, know, you have all this talk about God and things. But we, one of the things that, that Right Division does is it takes you out of all that superstitious nonsense business, and it helps you to appreciate the wisdom of God. It isn't about power. These, these preachers are word of faith stuff, and all, that's all about power. You make God move in your behalf, and it gets so confusing. I'm suffering, but I'm resisting, and I'm claiming God's healing, and I'm, because I'm claiming his healing, I, I'm resisting, but I'm still sick. You know, resist the devil and he'll flee from you, but he's still whacking me. Well, you just keep resisting, and that's godly suffering. And I'm thinking, godly suffering, that's a fool's errand, what that is. There's no godly, nothing godly, nothing godlike about that. You know how many times in the Bible when somebody would tell a demon to, to if somebody says in the name of Jesus Christ for a demon to flee, what would the demon do? He's got, no, he's got no power against the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know somebody says, well, then Mark 5, he didn't go right away. Yeah, but you've got no idea in the world why he won't anything about Mark 5. So don't start telling me about that stuff. That, bird did, that demon didn't want to leave the land. He didn't care anything about leaving the guy. He went in the pigs. Might have thought that was a step up. I don't know. But you, there's stuff going on there that, that people don't even have any idea about what's going on. And it, they all were talking about spiritual power. What, what they're talking about is just superstitious nonsense. But, you know, don't you want the power? Paul says that he, would, that he would strengthen you with might by his spirit in your inner man. Now, that's power. That word might that Paul uses there, where he's going to strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man, Ephesians 3.16, that's the same word that's talked about he does these mighty signs and wonders, mighty works. You see, the powerful working of the power of God in your life, he tells the Thessalonians to do the work of faith with power. But that's a, that's a spiritual power in your inner man. It's not moving cold fronts and snowstorms kind of stuff. And it's not coming in and zapping you and making your hair stand up and make you, woo, you know, but there's this inner working of the power of God. But all of that is according to a, a plan that's called wisdom. 
and God's essence works. And all that stuff works together. And it's fascinating to me anyway. The, that's not what he's telling this lady about, but I've I'm, I'm just been talking to you about it just a little bit. Because uh, when you understand the essence of God, and then you understand Jesus Christ is God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, who took upon him the essence of man, spirit, soul, and body, and holds each together in one person. And that's our contact point. And that's why God made him to be sin for us, that we might be, be made his righteous, the righteousness of God in him. He's the point where the justice of God puts us and where things are set right. And now we're compatible with all of the essence of God. And I think about that and I think, whoa, wow, what a, uh, what, what a thrilling thing it is to have that. We're, we now are spiritually qualified to be used by God and his plans and his purposes in the universe. And, and he, his plans and purposes in John 4 here with the nation Israel, but is also, we now know he has more plans than just with Israel that we're a part of the household of God too now, and that God's plan, when he said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I think about that verse because we talk about rightly dividing the word. The first verse in the Bible divided something, divided the universe into two parts, the heaven and the earth. And that division goes all through it's important to understand. You'll never, it, that one division right there, if you get that, you get everything else that happens in the Bible. And if you don't, you won't get the Bible. Well, the, um, the woman here is told, it isn't going to be religion and the outward stuff. It's going to be God. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Knowing Him. 